have any questions? High THC is not, except for pain, isn't really needed. And I'd like to have you guys comment on what you see in, in terms of the CBN, CBG, THCA, the whole host of things which we know have medical value. I didn't hear you talk much about that. And I would like to have, you know, the Swami is talking about spiritual and recreational. Uh, Mr. Rader is talking about medical. And I think those are two somewhat different things. I'd like to hear what you have to say about Great. that. I mean, I'll jump right into it. I mean, I think that the, the, one of the things we are going to see with, with, uh, with regulation is um, increased availability of uh, some of the cannabinoids we currently don't have access to. Um, there's a huge CBD bubble in the world right now. There's, I, I've been told there's as much as 50,000 um, kilos of CBD basically sitting around the world right now going nowhere uh, just because everybody decided, oh, we're going to be in the CBD business. Um, but what I want to see is I want to see THCV. I want to see CBDV. I want to see, um, I want to see some of these really weird breakdown products. I mean, there are only really, everybody always says, there's 120 cannabinoids. No, there aren't. There are four cannabinoids, okay? And then there are, are there breakdown products. Okay, and there are their propyl variants, and that's it. All right, and but some of these breakdown products, these are, are metabolites, and they have different effects. And we've only started to explore them. And so I think that exploring from a medicinal standpoint, the incredible utility of this plant um, is amazing. And I, I think we're going to be doing it for decades, which is really cool. One of the coolest parts about legalization and and and, and, and recreational marijuana or recreational marijuana becoming illegal is or cannabis, sorry, is um, is is that the, the the medical side of things can concentrate on, on on what's best for them, the the recreational side of things can concentrate on what's best for them. But there's somewhere in the middle that's your maybe nutraceutical. You know, take your daily cannabis supplement for for, for general health. Maybe I don't have a specific wellness, wellness, wellness. wellness. But exactly, and so. So I, I don't necessarily see them as having to be completely different things. I think there's, it's a spectrum. I think it's more of a bell curve than necessarily a black and white issue. Uh, my question is um, about uh, testing. Josh, you mentioned that, thank you. You mentioned that uh, somebody asked you to retest it again. That is the problem that I have with testing labs because um, I'm new, I understand that. I'm in the edible business and I want to be exact by my standards. And my standards are very severe. And yet when, you, when I test it, it comes back, how could that be? And they test it again, and okay, now it's accurate. And they just send it back to you to retest it again, and you retested it and found out in their favor. So how could anybody, me, um, feel comfortable and secure in paying for a testing lab but it's not accurate? Okay, well, so there's a lot of issues with that. And, and, and with edibles, it gets to be this whole, whole kind of conflated issue. So, so first of all, with edibles, um, I, I have this presentation I do about stratified sampling and, 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 and testing multiple samples through a, through a production run and, and having some sort of idea of the variance. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a number of things. First, edibles are extremely hard to test. To bring, to bring a, a sample into a testing lab that sees a cookie, a gummy bear, a piece of beef jerky, um, and all these things as, you know, as edibles, they're all completely different tests and really need their own validated tests for each one of those types of samples um, because you're testing completely different products. When I test a gummy bear versus a brownie, it's a completely different extraction process, a completely different test. So the testing lab needs to have different procedures for the different types of edibles. And, and I think, at, again, we're really glad to see people with, with budgets get into this because a lot of your edible producers don't want to spend the money they really should be spending to make a proper product. Um, you know, if, 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 if I was producing, say, omega-3 infused gummies, each production run, I'd be doing dozens of tests throughout that production run. Now, do I, do, do I run hot at the very beginning of the run and then, then, it, then about, you know, 10 units in, all of a sudden it starts to level off and I get homogeneity? There's also the issue with edibles is, is one side of the cookie completely different than the other side of the cookie? How many chocolate chips did you put in the cookie? Are the chocolate chips infused? And so I think what we get is we get edible makers that bring in one cookie from one batch, and then the next batch, and these are, these are the ones that are, that are doing a lot of testing, and then the next batch they bring in one cookie, and they're like, well, last batch it was 30% you know, higher, what, what's going on here? And it's like, well, the next cookie off the line would have been 50% higher, do you know that? You know, do you have an idea of what your production process is doing? And then, so, and I could go on and on about yeah, all I mean, the problems <laughs> with, with edible standardization. Let me, let me jump into one thing on that, which is the idea is that yeah. in every other industry, yeah. a winemaker doesn't go down always to the wine testing lab, 
the winemaker has a lab. Yeah. Okay? And I think that what you're going to see is, is that you're going to see a lot more companies take this in and then go to somebody who's an expert and say, test my testing. Yeah, that's right. All right? Yeah. And then I think it's going to become a lot more prevalent. Um, I and and when you when you hear yeah when, when you hear a retest, I mean that's most often because they didn't believe the value. It wasn't because the lab's trying to give them what they want to hear. That's a very important distinction, so you know. Um, yeah, and I mean flower testing can be hugely variable. So the top of the plant can be twice as much as the bottom. So how do I homogenize my entire batch so that I can get a good accurate value across the entire picture? That's really the goal of testing and we'll see this whole standardization effort be forced upon us with regulations. So you're going to be required to do statistically valid testing, not just one sample, not just a sample, but across your batch and make sure that that distributor actually really knows what's on the label of their product. And, and also, when, 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 you look at the, when you look at the composition of, let's say, alcoholic beverages, okay, like wine, you don't go in and pick up a bottle of wine and go, oh, I wonder what the expression of terpinaline is in this Cabernet, all right? The reason is, is that you're buying the wine, you're buying the kind of totality, the gestalt of it, and right now I think we're getting a little too granular sometimes in our look at this product, all right? It may not be as easily sliced and diced as everybody wants it. We just need to have a well-characterized, safe, pure product. Um, my question was kind of a, you know, a little obscure on, um, you know, kind of, the future of pot, but how much you know in the past and the traditions of the past have have had some type of possibly biological relevant or um, you know, psych, you know um, pharmacologically relevant uh, benefits. Um, the thing that's coming to mind is have if if any of you have um, ever tried like the Malawi cobs, and my question is kind of to you know what could have happened there to where you know you take a fresh cola and you wrap it in a certain type of leaf, you bury it in the ground, and there's this decomposing process. And so I'm wondering what kind of degradative terpenes, unique kind of, you know, degradated cannabinoids come about, because it's like this whole legend of, you know, this, and, and what, this and process, and is there anything the relevant of, to that? What's the right. high from aflatoxin? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, because I remember, I remember there was a whole phase in Mendo. You'll remember this, Swami. There was a whole phase for a while where people were burying their weed. And, and, you know, pulling it out of the ground and saying, man, this mold gets you. Uh, <laughs> what's really interesting, all the guys who are, like, promoting that died relatively young. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, Fred, he checked out at about 47, you know. But I, I think that there are indigenous techniques that we're, we're going to learn from. And I think that, you know, I mean, I, I think Malawi in, in, is a great place where there's a whole tradition of these gold lighter strings in Colombia. Um, the Colombian golds were often created by breaking the primary stem on the plant and bleaching it out right before um, it was finally harvested. Well, there's a whole tradition of stressing the plant in many ways. Some people used to drive a, spry, a spike right through the base of, of, the, of the stalk and so on. I just want to put a shout out for Panama Red. Anybody remember Panama Red? Psychedelic, man, absolutely. Uh, so high, high caryophylline strain, okay? Strains that smell like pepper, like can, like, like are, are basically high beta caryophylline strains. And um, and what's funny is the closest thing out there are some of the cookies variants now that are super super high in caryophylline and relatively low in myrcene. So. I want some opinion. I have a question here that um, I've been listening to some of the panels over the last few days and I've heard a lot of lawyers speak tell us about how you can't patent strains and you're not going to be able to do these things. But I didn't hear anybody talk about the future of um, how a breeder such as ourselves are going to go into the future and other than the old term hoarding strains, um, I'd like to know if anybody up here can give us any practical advice on um, how we're going to go into the future uh, creating this intellectual property and identifying it and owning it. Well, oops, wrong one again. Right. Speaking with, uh, I think, Andrea Brooks, Yesterday, I'm one of the panelists. I spoke to her afterwards about, uh, you know, the idea of patenting uh, these different strains that are cultivars. I should say that you, that you, that people are getting just from crossing, 
you know, endlessly crossing these hybrids. And you, it, even if you come up with something unique, uh, once you put it out in the public domain, you sell clones of it or you sell seeds of it or whatever, it's gone in terms of your patent, all right? You have to patent it first before it is ever commercialized. Uh, but I think that really the, the patents besides that, the patents that will really make a big difference are the ones that, disease, uh, that uh, uh, are about disease control, about uh, having resistance to botrytis and, and PM and, and that sort of thing. And I think that somebody who finds those genes and incorporates them into strains, that's really going to be something. So I can, I can address a little bit of this. So plant variety rights, okay, that's one kind of plant patent, all right? And that is a, that's a clone, okay? It's not seed. And you can't prevent somebody from breeding with your plant, which is great. That means innovation. So you can have your version of strawberry cough. Okay, and if there's no prior art out there that, that precludes that, or if nobody can say he's actually growing my plant, if you can prove it to the satisfaction of the patent office that you're novel and, and meet all the requirements for that particular kind of plant, as long as it's clonally propagated, or probably tissue propagated, you're cool. See, you're not cool at all, okay? And a deposit actually has to be that plant, okay? Now, a utility patent, patent which I got, okay? A utility patent on cannabis, is, is that you have a class that is novel, okay? We bred a group of cannabis plants, and man, I'll tell you, the patent office, because we were the first application, they are really trying to bust us. They, they were sending us results from Analytical 360 in Washington about a CBD crew variety from the south of Spain, and, and I had to drive all over the west coast getting samples of these varieties and test them with a validated method and submit them to the patent office for every rejection letter we got. And that went on for months and months and months until finally they said, okay, you win, here's the patent. And we have a patent on a very narrow range of type twos, CBD and THC together, that don't produce myrcene, okay? And that's the key. This is like, because finding high myrcene plants with CBD in them, that's super easy. Finding CBD plants that don't have mercy in them, that's really hard. And that's what we did. We spent three years breeding it. So, two more questions. you can get a patent, two kinds. Everybody said that here is cannabis, medical cannabis, here is medicine, here's the FDA, here's all this stuff. And no one talked about integrating all that stuff. The problem with medicine, as far as I'm concerned, and I've been in it for my entire life, is that we have so siloed every specialty, every new thing that's come along. And the worst thing we want is to be siloed as a different, alternative, oppositional type of therapy. And the real success is gonna be if we follow the biopsychosocial model, all chronic disease involves all those aspects, and what kind of combination of specific cannabinoids, or specific cannabinoid plants, with other types of traditional and medical treatments is gonna really help that particular patient in front of you. And all the rest, I think, is just gonna drive a wedge in us that the, that the AMA and FDA and pharma just are very happy to see happen. Um, I can talk to that. Um, I just met uh, Dave at, at lunch time. the other day. We had a, a wonderful little conversation. So I thank you for that question because uh, I actually, uh, I don't think there's a difference between uh, what's called recreational and medicinal use. Yes. I really don't think that's the case at all. And there are people who say, well, I want to just have fun. Well, how many medicines are out there for mood alteration, right? How many medicines are out there with unbelievable side effects, right? So I think that the spiritual aspect of cannabis is essentially why it heals. And all the different specific ways that it heals, we're gonna have Jeff and various people pinpoint that for us when you need it for that. But I think it's, they did tests with CBD, you know about the C, they repressed CBD and these people got suicidal when they had a, a drug that repressed. We have CBD, we need CBD as our basic health wellness in our body. So I don't think there's really a difference. We use this, this cannabis to 
alter our consciousness and to elevate us, and that's part of the healing process. And yeah, I find it a false dichotomy. And I also think that we, we do want to have, we do want all the muggles to be here. We want it to be mainstream because it's really an essential part of, of, of really coming alive. I, yeah. That's good, that's good, great, thank you. I write books on efficient cannabis use, and my specialty is low-dose cannabis. Unless you're a grower, like Kyle Cushman or Swami, these two are brothers from another mother to me. Smoking a joint is the least efficient way to use cannabis. For the average user, they're wasting their money. And the cannabis strains that are available today one hit is enough to get you completely high. And then you put your joint out and when you light it again, you just get a massive dose of hydrocarbons. Any comments, Swami, Kyle Kushman, sure. the board? This on. Well, one of the things that I think is, is wrong, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, I was on a team that was consulting with a group from uh, uh, Vegas. Uh, who wanted to build a, a, a grow and, and so forth, and, and the investors were absolutely fascinated by how strong uh, the, uh, the cultivars that we had and we had to offer. And at, at a certain point, I said, you know, you're really looking at this the wrong way. I said, most of your people are not going to be uh, native uh, uh, Las Vegans. They're going to be, you know, tourists coming in here and uh, they're going to get their, their medical thing here, which they thought at the time that that would happen, and uh, then go in the, and they're going to buy something. So I said, you're going to sell them joints that have 20% THC in them. They're going to have a bad experience. They're naive, right? They're going to smoke that joint, and they're going to say, oh, I forgot how to breathe. My heart is exploding. You know, this sort of thing. They're going to end up in the emergency ward. You know? I said, you don't want that experience. I said, you could much more easily just roll up uh, fan, uh, leaves from this stuff and, and have 5% have THC joined as their first experience. I mean, we were smoking stuff back in the 60s and 70s that was like 2 to 3% THC. I mean, really. And had a great time with it, exactly. I mean, so the idea of having these massive amounts, uh, to me, you know, I mean, the, the idea that you're wasting this, the, the point is this stuff is not going to be that expensive, and especially if you're growing it yourself. I mean, I throw away, when I'm finished with that joint, probably what most people start their joints with. You know, uh, it's just... <laughs> yeah, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me jump in. So one thing that we didn't talk about in the evolution of cannabis is the evolution of dose, okay? And that's a whole other panel, and I hope we have it someday, because the future of this is understanding that a lot of the constituents of cannabis um, exhibit biphasic dose. In other words, it does one thing at one dose and one thing at another. And there's this whole interesting concept, and there's a bunch of really cool papers by GW Guy, who found in GW Pharmaceuticals, um, about hormesis. And hormesis is this idea of a very, very, very small dose actually causing a profound change in an organism. And it's, it, has, it works on scientific levels, it works on spiritual levels. It's, it's a fascinating, fascinating topic. And there's a, a scientist in Israel who's been doing research on showing that your first dose of THC is neurotoxic. And it works almost like an inoculant, like a vaccine, all right, to adjust how you will respond to a, a phytocannabinoid from that point forward. This guy's published like six or seven really good papers. And, um, and he's from a really prestigious university in Israel. And what it is is that we don't know. And I'll tell you one thing that I do know is we don't have a good conception of cannabis dose today. And that part of the evolution of our discussion about cannabis will take that focus towards dose. Because there's room in this tent for somebody who wants to smoke a joint. And there's room in this tent for somebody who wants to take a hit. Okay. Yeah, well, there's the microdose, people are talking about microdosing quite a bit. We're done. We're done. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't microdose. <laughs>